Let's give a nice warm radio remote welcome. Welcome back to the program. Arnie Gunderson, who is with Fairwind Associates in Burlington and uh, an expert on nuclear power issues. Gosh, it seems like it's been forever since we had you on, Arnie. How are you? I'm, I'm just fine, Mark. Yeah, we have this gift that keeps on giving over there in, in, in Brattleboro, so I'm, I'm sure this won't be the last time either. Yeah. Uh, actually, you know, it's funny because when I contacted you, I really the plan was to talk about Fukushima, and then this other story came out. So let's start there with Vermont Yankee and what's going on down there. I would dare say these recent tests that are showing strontium-90 are not news to you. Yeah, we had, uh, um, Maggie and I uh, were contracted through uh, uh, the Joint Fiscal Office five years ago to write a report about the uh, the issues related to the leak. And, um, you know, Entergy has called this thing the uh, tritium leak forever, and so is the NRC. But unlike all the other plants in the country, Vermont Yankee didn't leak tritium. Vermont Yankee leaked strontium and cesium and cobalt-60 and other things because of where the leak was in the plant. The other, other plants that have had leaks around the world have not had the kind of leak Vermont Yankee had. So uh, it was detected in the soil five years ago that there was strontium, that there was cesium and, uh, and other isotopes. So they're, they're like pebbles in a, in a stream. They move with the stream, but they don't move as fast as the stream. Mm -hmm. So, you know, back in 2010, God, it's hard to believe it's five years ago. <laughs> back in 2010, we detected tritium at the monitoring wells down at the river. And um, uh, Maggie and I said all along that uh, the other pebbles in the stream, the strontium and the cesium, would eventually uh, get there, too. And that's what happened. This week, the uh, uh, Entergy announced, uh, actually the state announced, that they had detected strontium in the monitoring wells along the river. Mm -hmm. All right, so how big a deal is this? I think it's a huge deal. And I think it's we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. You know, if they've just picked it up, the odds are, just like with the tritium, you know, they picked it up and it got worse and worse and worse. If they just pick this up, um, one, it's going to continue for years, and two, um, it's going to go up in value. Right now, it's at half EPA allowable. So it's uh, it's still within the EPA standards, but uh, it doesn't take uh, but a couple more months before we'll be over the EPA allowables as well. So, but the, the big deal for Vermonters, though, um, as long as Entergy owns the site, nobody's drinking that water. Um, they'll make the the case that it's it's not drinking water, so therefore the EPA numbers don't apply. But the big deal for Vermonters is that it's dramatically raised the cost for decommissioning. You know, there's, um, there's a case down in Connecticut at uh, Connecticut Yankee where they had a um, unknown strontium leak that hit the groundwater, and it added to the cost of the decommissioning of the plant an extra billion dollars. So, you know, you, add that, you throw that around with 700,000 Vermonters, and that means everybody's on the hook for 1300 bucks a piece. It's a big deal. Wow. Uh, describe you've described this before on the program, but what is strontium ninety, and why is it particularly nasty stuff? Yes, if you if you remember back to high school chemistry, that chart that hung on the wall, uh, your bones are made of calcium, and right below that on that periodic table is strontium. So it behaves exactly like calcium, and so when strontium ninety is in um, in drinking water, anything that um, is made of calcium is going to absorb the strontium, thinking that it's calcium. So, you know, things like um, uh, the uh, shells on, on um, the different kinds of snails that are in the river, of course, will pick it up. But um, the fish bones will pick it up. And, of course, humans uh, pick it up as well. Now, what makes it nasty is that um, uh, outside the body, it does nothing. It, it's a very weak energy source. So it doesn't penetrate your skin. But when it gets under the skin and hooks up next to an organ, like your bone is right next to your bone marrow, it, uh, it produces leukemia. So it's um, one of the more carcinogenic um, elements. So the, the limit is only eight um, picocuries per liter compared to tens of thousands of picocuries per liter for tritium. So it's clearly identified by scientists all over the place that uh, this is a really nasty actor. And why does it? Why is it produced? What What's it a product of? Uh, when the uh, when, when a uranium atom splits two thirty five, it splits into a heavier half and a lighter half. 
And the heavier half is usually cesium, 137, and the lighter half is usually strontium, 90. Um, and if you add those two up, you get close to, you know, 90 plus one, uh, 137 gets you close to the weight of uranium, 235. So they're, they're the two pieces of radioactive rubble when you split a, um, a, a uranium atom. And what happened is back in the 70s and 80s and 90s and even in a period of 2000, uh, Vermont Yankee had a, had a pump called the hogging pump that was used during startups. And when the fuel was leaking, this is back 2010, even 30 years ago, when the fuel was leaking, the hogging pump uh, pulled off these radioactive gases and put them in a tunnel. And the pipe in that tunnel over time broke. So the tunnel became contaminated with cesium and strontium and something called cobalt-60 as well. And uh, it sat in that tunnel until it began to leak in 2007, and that leak was finally detected in 2010. That was the, the you know the big issue at the uh, um, the last year of the uh, Douglas administration was right. that was that huge leak. Right. So the uh, um, the leak has been leaking since 2007. The strontium moves through the soil slower than the tritium, but it's moving. And uh, this is an indication now that it's heading toward the river. Okay, so if this hits the river, I'm sure that the argument from the health department from Yankee is going to be that it's an insignificant quantity. Is that a fair statement? Um, you know, you're not drinking. Uh, it's not about drinking it in the river. Um, it's, it will be below the EPA limits for drinking it in the river. But it bioaccumulates, and what that means is it's, it's like mercury and tuna. You know, it, it works its way up the food chain, and when a, a little critter absorbs it and gets it eaten by a bigger animal that gets eaten by a bigger animal, it bioaccumulates up the food chain. So the uh, I, I think for... You know, perhaps you know, for 30 years, we'll probably be sampling the fish in the river because that's the, uh, you know, one of these top animals like a catfish, something that lives on the bottom, a bottom dweller, uh, that's going to be eating these um, uh, calcium-containing um, uh, either small animals or small uh, vegetables that uh, are on the bottom of the uh, the river, and. Uh, we're likely going to see um, strontium in their in their bones for you know, 20, 30, 40 years. We're talking with nuclear power expert Arnie Gunderson. You can join us at 244-1777, toll-free 877-291-8255. You argue they should clean this up now. Yeah, you know, we said this five years ago. Um, the report Maggie and I wrote that's on the Joint Fiscal Office site, uh, we recommended that the... Um, uh, first, they had had in 2010 extraction wells, and at the end of the Douglas administration, the beginning of the first Shumlin administration, those wells were turned off. And what they were doing, Energy was pulling water out of the ground, which was preventing that water from heading toward the river. Well, turning off those extraction wells was a mistake because now it allowed the the plume, the radioactive water, to move toward the river as the uh, groundwater pushes it toward the river. So we turned off the extraction wells, and now you know the horse is out of the barn. But the barn still has a lot of horses in it. And by, by that, what I mean is that the the building that had the leak, it was called the AOG building, the Advanced Off-Gas Building. Mm -hmm. It was built in 1970, and they still call it Advanced. <laughs> but it okay. has... Uh, a large amount of cesium and strontium under it. And I'm not talking about dismantling the entire nuclear site right now. We clearly can't afford that. But it makes sense that we know the ground is contaminated with cesium and strontium. And that building should be uh, decontaminated and, and, and destroyed. We should get down into the ground under the building and remove the strontium before it starts to move. You know, it's, um, uh, pay me now or pay me later. But if we if we spend the money now, we're likely to save ten times that in the future, because we wind up paying by the cubic foot when we dispose this waste. You pay by the cubic foot. So if the strontium is moved and it's uh, you know suddenly um, 
you know, two, three, four hundred feet away from this building, then there's a lot more cubic feet involved in shipping it off site. So my point is that let's knock that building down right now to prevent the strontium from moving and keep the overall cost of the decommissioning down. Let's go to the phone. Jamie, good morning. Good morning, Mark. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Good. I wanted to ask Arnie if he'd um, a question and ask him if he'd explain something. Um, I'm sure both of these substances, the strontium and the cesium, have a nuclear half-life. And maybe Arnie could tell us what the nuclear half-life of those substances is. And for those in the audience that don't understand a nuclear half-life, maybe he could explain what that means. All right. Thank you for your call. Sure. That, yeah, that's a great question. They both have about the same half-life, uh, 30 years. And what that means is that, uh, let's say there's um, a million atoms of this stuff now. Well, 30 years from now, there will be 500,000 atoms. And then 30 years after that, there won't be nothing. There will be 250,000 atoms. And 30 years after that, there will be... 125,000 atoms. So every 30 years, whatever there was before, it gets cut in half. So the rule of thumb is 10 half-lives and it's all gone. So if we're willing to wait 300 years, 30 times 10, um, the, the strontium and the cesium in the soil will have decayed away. But, uh, you know, we want to get the site back as a a useful, productive piece of Vermont. And I don't think anybody wants to wait 10 half-lives to... Uh, um, you know, to allow this stuff to decay. Two four four seventeen seventy seven. That's our local number in Central Vermont. You can also reach us toll free at eight seven seven two nine one eight two five five. As everybody, I think, is pretty well aware, the uh, the Entergy plant is now uh, no longer operating, and it's gone into. It's supposed to be decommissioned at some point here. There was a story yesterday, Arnie, I don't know uh, what your reaction is to this. An Entergy Corp official said Wednesday, telling the Associated Press, the company is offering no guarantees it will pay to decommission its retired Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant if the job's still not done by the end of a 60-year period. Yeah, that was, uh, that was frightening, but not surprising. Uh, um, Peter Bradford, a, a Vermonter who um, used to be on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, wrote in 2003, and then Maggie and I wrote again in 2007, that the, the NRC allowed these companies to become what's called the Limited Liability Corporation. Uh, before, you know, before Vermont Yankee was sold, sold, the utilities of the state owned it, and there was a relationship between the ratepayers and the uh, um, and the power plant. Right. But what's happened now is that when Energy bought it, they just sell m power into the wholesale market, and there's no commitment from any ratepayer to buy it. And so what they formed was this thing called the Limited Liability Corporation, which is designed to protect energy in the case Vermont Yankee goes belly up. And they actually have three LLCs. Vermont Yankee is owned by an LLC, which is owned by an LLC, which is owned by an LLC. And finally, Entergy um, gets it, gets the money. So the money can go up through those LLCs, but it never goes down. And what Entergy said yesterday was, was truly frightening. They said that you know, we're an LLC. We're going to uh, the corporation will be protected 60 years out. And if you want to sue us, we'll fight it out in court 60 years from now. Um, but we don't believe we'll be on the hook if 60 years out we wind up with any uh, any additional costs. And, you know, we've been saying that, uh, Fairwinds has been saying that for uh, six or seven years now. So mm -hmm. it was not surprising to me, but it was the first time that Entergy admitted that um, uh, they plan to duke it out with the state if there's uh, still... Um, you know, a contaminated site 70, uh, 60 years from now. I'm, I'm missing something in this equation here. So they, they've been trying to push out the decommissioning to the point where the decommissioning fund is healthy. What, why is there, what's magic about this 60-year number? The 60-year number is in NRC regulations, and it's, uh, the NRC calls it safe store, S-A-F-S-T-O-R-E, but if you really pronounce it the way your third-grade English teacher told you, it's really SAP store. So this, uh, uh, the NRC has allowed utilities to wait 
60 years to uh, allow these plants to be decommissioned. So here's from my Yankee. It ran 40, but it can stay there for 100 years while the, uh, while the decommissioning fund builds up. What's really happening, there's no basis in science for 60 years. The, um, the, the law is made to protect the utilities and the owners to keep their costs down. You know, if they had to, if they were a windmill in Vermont, they'd have to put all their decommissioning money up front before they started to turn the blades. But because they're a nuclear power plant, they can wait 100 years, the 40 to operate and the other 60, uh, before they have enough money to decommission the plant to, to turn it back into a farmer's field. So that 60-year argument, the NRC will say, well, we're doing it to protect the poor workers from radiation. But in fact, when a power plant wants to operate um, because it's shut down for uh, you know, some sort of a mechanical problem, uh, the NRC doesn't care about the radiation exposure to workers, um, whereas uh, they use that argument to allow a longer um, period to uh, decontaminate the plant when, they, you know, when it's shut down forever. It's really a subsidy to the nuclear industry. Mm-hmm. All right. Is there, it doesn't sound like there's anything anybody can or is likely to do about this. Well, you know, I don't think it was well thought, thought out. When the NRC allowed these companies to be spun off as LLCs, um, there were people like Peter Bradford and uh, a little bit later Maggie and I that, that talked about how it, was, uh, uh, it, it had some long-term dangers. But the NRC never thought, thought it through. And I really think now it's time to get guys like Bernie um, and um, you know, Senator Sanders and, and uh, Ed Markey. There's a couple of senators who are very interested in this. And there's still an opportunity to change the regulations. Vermont is the only the second merchant plant to be decommissioned. So, and there's 40 others after it. So we have an opportunity as Vermonters to change the law, if not for us, for the for the 40 other plants that are that are in this train that are eventually going to have to be um, decommissioned. We're talking with Arnie Gunderson. He's with Fairwind Associates, which he runs with his wife, Maggie. They are experts on uh, nuclear power issues. Jim asks a good question here uh, to ask you to put into uh, context here this question about the leak materials. Are we talking about, in, in terms of risk that we can understand, he says, are we talking about the risk of riding in a car, the risk of being hit by an asteroid, or somewhere in between? Can, can you give me the first part of that the question? Yeah. They, they, I had a listener who wrote in who wanted to know if you could put into context the danger of these leaked materials that we were ah. talking about earlier. And he's asking whether the risk is more like riding in a car or the risk of being hit by an asteroid, or somewhere in between. I'm guessing somewhere in between. Okay, we uh, I had a hearing aid problem there. We had a, uh, a case that Maggie and I worked on down in uh, uh, Florida where um, a plant was leaking and uh, into their sewage system, and the sewage was getting spread on farmer's fields. And it was strontium-90 and cesium-137 and things like that. Um, and there's a statistically meaningful cancer cluster of 39 kids um, that developed a very rare brain cancer and we were able to trace strontium 90 into their baby teeth so uh, you know it's is it going to wipe out the, the, the town of Vernon no but is it uh, uh, is it a cancer substance that's now in the river and will be for a long time uh, yeah so there's a there's a meaningful increase in the, the chance that downstream communities will have for um, uh, you know for these rare cancers over the next uh, over the next hundred years. You know we shouldn't worry about the grammar school though because they, there's a grammar school right across the street, 1,500 yards away. But the water moves f from the school toward the river, so we're pushing this material out into uh, into the river. But if we want the site back, if we want to use it for farming and the farmer pumps a well and things like that, um, at that point, reusing that site for a uh, agricultural purpose, um, would, you know, it, it could be game over. We, we just won't know until we pop a couple more wells down there and determine if there's still strontium in the water. Wow. Did, I'm just, I have to make sure I heard this right. So they, 
spread manure on a field and that had strontium in it they grew crops and those ultimately that showed up in the teeth of children yeah it's um the, wow. the, it's ler licensee event report 82 from 1982 045 is the uh, is the specifics on the on the case uh the nrc was aware of the leak in 1982 and uh, really didn't do due diligence, um, but that's a, that's another long story, Mark. Let's uh, go to Callis. Good morning, Cynthia. How are you today? Hi. Good morning. Thank you for the show. Um, I wanted to. You touched on it just a few minutes ago. I wanted you to explain the dangers of having uh, decommissioning a nuclear reactor plant right across from the school, and there's also one across the river, and also. Explain um, what happened with the radiological health rule uh, several years ago, in the, somewhat covertly, in the Douglas administration. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Cynthia. Well, the uh, yeah, thanks. That's a great question. There, and, uh, um, we've been commissioned. Ferrans has been commissioned by the Lintelac Foundation to do a, a study of the energy plan to decommission. For my Yankee, and we'll have a report out uh, in in March. The NRC comment period ends in on March 23rd, so we'll be providing a detailed report on this. But the issue of the school is critical. Um, you know, for my Yankee, safer shut down than it was running. There's no doubt about that. But there still is the equivalent of 700 nuclear bombs worth of cesium in the fuel pool. Now it has to stay in the fuel pool for five years because it's physically hot. And but at the end of five years, what happens is it gets put into heavy stainless steel containers, empty the containers weigh about 70 tons, and then they put about 30 tons of uranium fuel in it, and then uh, put a lid on it and, sh and, and lower that very carefully down from 120 feet down to the ground. Now, if you remember back in 07 or 08, there was a, uh, a brake failure on the crane that lifts this heavy thing. So we know as Vermonters that the brakes can fail and you can lose control of a canister. So what, what we will be proposing, Fairwinds will be proposing in this report to the NRC is you've got to get the fuel out of the fuel pool. There's, it's, it's not safe up there as a terrorist target and it's best on the ground, there's no doubt about it. But the period from the time you start to move it to the time you get it on the ground, um, I think we should do that in the summer when the school is closed because it is the, in the next five years, it's the most dangerous time in the plant. It's one of those cases, it's a low but not zero probability of an accident. You know, the brakes can fail and this 100 ton uh, container can fall. Um, we've had that happen in Vermont where the brakes failed. Um, so that um, we have an opportunity though, to make sure that we don't have kids 1,500 yards away. So one of our recommendations is going to be to uh, do it in the summer when the school is not in session. And that would hold for the, you're right, there's a school over in New Hampshire as well that would uh, also be affected. The, the other question, uh, the, Vermont is the only state in the country that had a 25 millirem that's a measure of radiation limit at the fence boundary. And when Entergy got the power up rate, they exceeded that 25 millirem number. But what they did was they bought the property along their site boundary, so they moved the site boundary out. Moved and the fence. They moved the fence. The Department of Health changed the way they calculated the, the, the millirem. Uh, that was uh, argued back in, uh, I want to say, oh, perhaps 06 or 07. And uh, the department uh, did not change the way it calculated it. Um, but uh, the law was pretty clear, and the department uh, changed its calculations to help, um, to help energy continue with the plant. Am I remembering this right? Didn't they move the fence back out at one point, too? Yeah, they bought more farms. So all those houses along the, the road there, they just bought them out. And essentially that allowed them to claim that the uh, dose at the fence line was below the state limit. Yeah. Uh, okay, we're going to take a short break. Uh, we'll come back, continue our discussion with Arnie Gunderson with Fairwinds Associates. We're also going to talk about Fukushima, what's the latest there, and we'll uh, be back right after this. Before we take any more calls here, I want to just uh, have you flesh out a little bit for us here where things stand with the uh, the Fukushima crisis. 
Gosh, you know, you talk about how you couldn't believe it was five years ago, the uh, tritium and other problems in Vermont Yankee. It's hard to believe it's coming up on four years with Fukushima, huh? Yeah, no, it's uh, um, it's still out of control. You know, they the containments didn't contain. That's really the the bottom line for the looking back over four years. The, uh, the, the these supposedly robust nuclear containments were the last line of defense, and uh, everything failed. But that last line of defense should have should have held, and it didn't. So we've got. It wasn't like we have a China syndrome, which is when the molten, molten fuel melts through the containment. But the temperatures and pressures got so high in the containment, it blew the, uh, blew the top off the containment and blew the seals in the sidewalls. And what I mean by that is that wires and pipes go through the side of the containment, and they're, they're, there's a little rubber uh, fitting that the pipes slide through. Um, that was never designed for the pressures and temperatures and radiation that they saw. So all that rubber deteriorated. That's allowing groundwater to leak in to the containment, suck up the radioactive material, and then run right back out. When, when Fukushima was built 40 years ago, they cut a cliff. And uh, in the process, they changed the groundwater flow. And groundwater has been flowing into Fukushima, uh, Daiichi, into the, the plants there to the tune of 400 tons of groundwater every day for 50 years now. So, uh, but it was always clean. You know, there was never a, a radioactive plant. So they would, they would come in, they would pump it out, and, and uh, there was no problem. But for the last four years, now we've got a contaminated plant. So as the groundwater flows in, it's picking up all the radioactivity from the nuclear fuel and transporting it right into the, uh, right into the ocean. They're already seeing um, below, uh, I'm sorry, above uh, legally acceptable levels of uh, strontium and cesium in the bottom growing fish as far away as uh, 20 or 30 miles from the facility. This is, um, this is significant because, you know, again, other animals will eat those fish and, and gradually transport it. We also saw uh, lower levels of uh, cesium in tuna that were caught off of California, and in salmon that are being caught up in uh, Alaska. Now, uh, those levels are much lower than um, what the government allows, but already off of Fukushima, uh, as, as far away as you know, several tens of miles, we're seeing fish that are above those limits. And they haven't stopped the leak, and so they're essentially it's bleeding into the ocean and will for for tens, if not uh, you know, a hundred years, it's um, uh, it's a problem that was foreseen back in 2011. I was one of the people that mentioned it, but but prominent Japanese did as well. The trick is to prevent the groundwater from coming in, and I think the Japanese are focusing on the wrong side. They're trying to prevent the leaks from going out. Right almost like you know when you got a tub and you've got the water running in the tub do you build the walls on the on the tub higher or do you turn the spigot off right right cuz i mean turn yeah. the spigot off they need to prevent the groundwater from coming in but that's I, my, my recollection is that that's almost like trying to stop a river coming into the the plant I mean, it's a, <laughs> yeah it is um, what i had proposed back in 2011 was to build a trench uh, you know perhaps um, it would be six feet wide and down to ground, uh, down to bedrock, which would be about um, 70 or 80 feet deep. And you fill it with a material called zeolite, which is the uh, material that uh, it's a volcanic rock, and it's really good at absorbing uh, cesium. And outside of that trench, put in extraction wells that would pump clean water to lower the water table. Mm -hmm. And I was told in 2011 that um, uh, TEPCO, Tokyo Electric, didn't have the money to uh, to spend on it. So now they've come up with a harebrained scheme where instead of a zeolite trench, they're going to build an ice wall. And it's going to be yeah. two miles yeah. long. Yeah. They're pumping these they'll, they'll, they're pipes that they're putting down in the ground. They're going to pump refrigerant into the pipes and try to freeze the earth for two miles. <clears throat> it's going to use uh, about a million dollars uh, a month in, in electricity to keep this gigantic refrigerator running. Yes. And uh, the theory is that the ice wall would prevent the groundwater from moving in. It's never been done before, so it's sort of a Hail Mary pass.
Well, I mean, you wonder what would ever happen if they had another earthquake, tsunami, electrical. I mean, how long can the power be out before that starts getting a little like a bad hockey rink? Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Let's take a couple of other calls here. Let's go up to Greensboro. Good morning, David. Good morning, Mark, and good morning, Dr. Anderson. Um, my grandchildren are going to be eating the tuna that eat the smaller bottom fish. They live in Kamakura, which is south of Tokyo. They've been there for some years. They'll be there for a few years more. Um, your observation that strontium is drawn to the calcium in their teeth and in their bones uh, scares me to death. Uh, it's one thing to think about um, these things in the abstract. It's another thing to think about them as affecting your grandchildren. So I'm delighted with the report, and on the other hand, I'm uh, angry that TEPCO and the government of Japan hasn't done more to prevent water loaded with radioactive materials from going into the ocean. And right now it doesn't look like that's going to happen. I know they're throwing water in to cool the reactors. That's got to be coming out with the groundwater as well. So... Thanks for your observations and uh, education. Is there anything that you and Fairwind can do to uh, keep this before the Japanese public through Japan Times, for instance, mm -hmm. rather than just trying to affect uh, unlistening government officials? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. You know, what is the coverage today over there, too? Yeah. Thank you, David. Yep. Gosh, that's a great and very touching uh, uh, comment. Uh, a couple of thoughts. Um, when, when I've been in Japan, which is twice in the last uh, three years, I, I don't eat the fish um, and um, because you just don't know where it came from. Even on the Sea of Japan side, which is the west side between Japan, Fukushima's on the Pacific, the east side, but the contamination ran into the mountain range that's between them. And even on the Sea of Japan side, we're finding high levels of cesium in the rivers that are running out of the mountain ranges. So it's pretty much everywhere in Japan. And my personal decision is, uh, uh, personally, I don't eat uh, fish from the Pacific, and that's a personal choice because the government's not telling me what's in it. But for the Japanese... You have no idea where that fish is coming from. The, the fishermen at Fukushima take their boats down south and uh, use that water, uh, use those fish, and sell them at different markets so that it um, it doesn't um, um, it doesn't show as a Fukushima fish. So they're trying desperately to get around the um, uh, around the limits. Uh, Maggie and I wrote a book over there, um, which is called Fukushima Daiichi: The Truth and the Future in Japanese, and uh, it was number one on the uh, um, the, the Japanese uh, Amazon.jp science section for, for five months. Um, so, you know, the gentleman said, well, you can pick up the book still uh, for sale on Amazon.jp if, if your um, relatives are interested. The other thing, though, is they, the Japanese uh, have a lot of fish stew, and that's extraordinarily dangerous because the uh, they're not measuring for strontium. Strontium is called an HTD. It stands for hard to detect. So they're looking for cesium, but they're not reporting strontium. But if cesium's there, you know strontium is too. So the, it's in the fish bones, and when you make a fish stew, you throw the whole fish in the stew and then eat the stew. Um, so eating fish stew in Japan from from fish that are uh, you know locally caught around the around the coast of Japan is um, extraordinarily unhealthy We're there's a lot of questions there i don't know if i answered them mm -hmm. all no I, I think you did uh i'm going to just go back to vermont yankee for a moment here you mentioned this study that you're doing for the lintel act foundation which you're going to present some findings to the nuclear regulatory commission you mentioned this idea uh, that you would recommend that sooner rather than later that the company move the fuel rods out of the pool and into uh, dry cast storage now, they're supposed to do that by 2015, I read somewhere, right? No, they, they've got it out of the nuclear reactor by 2015. It sits in the pool because it's physically hot until, um, um, until 2019 or 2020. It has to sit for about five years before it's physically cool enough 
to be air-cooled in these casks. And everybody agrees that it should be moved after five years. Entergy wants it out, and the state wants it out, and I want it out. So there's no question that it reduces the risk dramatically to, um, uh, to build up the... Um, uh, to, to get this stuff from the pool onto the ground. In the meantime, though, what we're suggesting is that the uh, emergency plan be kept in place, and Entergy doesn't want to do that. But, you know, it's it's about $2 million bucks a year. Entergy's claiming it's $100 million and, and trying to say that they can't afford it. But really, uh, the question is, we've got an emergency plan that could be implemented in the event there's a problem for the next five years. And at, at $2 million a year, that's a cost Vermonters should be willing to say, okay, take it from the decommissioning fund. Um, that's a cost that, um, to reduce the, the risk, to reduce the consequences if an event happens. Um, it's, a, it's a cost we're willing to take out of the emergency, out of the uh, decommissioning fund. It seems to be a, a prudent use of, you know, perhaps, you know, $2 million a year for five years or $10 million out of a $650 million fund. Mm -hmm. Are there any other significant recommendations you're going to make besides moving the fuel rods and keeping the emergency plan intact? Uh, yeah, there's, a, there's, there's two big ones that, that on the finance side of this thing that affect all of us. Um, first is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission said last week, uh, Susan Small here wrote the uh, story in, um, on January 30th, so two weeks ago. Um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission said that Entergy is responsible for decommissioning the plant whenever it happens. And here's Entergy saying yesterday that if it gets out 60 years, they're out of there. So clearly there's a, an argument that needs to be argued out now between the state of Vermont, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and Entergy about where that responsibility lies. Because remember, we're the, we're the second plant to be decommissioned, and there's a, another 40 of these merchant plants lined up behind us. But the other thing is, and this was never thought of before, is that um, when they spun off Entergy, there's no longer any public oversight of how the fund is spent. Now, Entergy is giving that money to a wholly owned subsidiary called TLG Engineering. And they basically couldn't make money while the plant was running, but they're turning the decommissioning into a profit center. So they're making money by giving the decommissioning process to this company called TLG Engineering, which they own, mm -hmm. so that the $600 million will get run through an Entergy subsidiary, and whatever profits are associated with that will flow into Entergy. So you know, wow. our position there is that Doug Hoffer and the... Uh, um, and, and the state, perhaps the Public Service Commission, but certainly the, the uh, state auditor should have permission to audit how that money's being spent. It doesn't seem to me that the person who's responsible for the decommissioning should be making a profit on the decommissioning. But that's what the NRC has allowed to occur when it's spun these plants off as LLCs. Hmm. Okay. You mentioned there was another, there were two financial issues, or did you, you dealt with both of those, right? Yeah, I think they're, they're both in the, in the same, in that same category. Let me go to Randolph Center here. Good morning, Nancy. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Um, thanks for having Mr. Gunderson on. Um, my question is, I, my, my understanding is the regulations about the amount of radiation were changed by the EPA um, in the last several years. Um, and I wonder how, how much that changed, and also does the EPA or some government agency um, measure radiation in this country? Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right. Yeah, the, the EPA number for strontium is uh, eight picocuries per liter. Uh, uh, just remember eight, and the well is at almost four, so it's essentially half of what the EPA number is. Um, other isotopes have different limits. Like I said, tritium is uh, um, 30,000, I think. So it's, uh, the limit is, depends on the uh, health consequences, and so it clearly shows that this strontium is a, is a bad actor. The, uh, the issue of who monitors the radiation has been fought at uh, in Washington for years. And inside the fence boundary, the EPA has no jurisdiction. Inside the fence boundary, it's Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, jurisdiction, which they defer to the licensee, to, to Entergy. So that the 
um, uh, measuring the groundwater is something that the NRC expects Entergy to be doing, and there really is no other agency oversight. Now, hopefully those, those samples get shared with the state of Vermont. Uh, they had been when the plant was running, but I'm not sure that you know, post-decommissioning um, uh, that, that, that protocol will continue. And uh, um, so the number's eight, uh, and we're at four right now. It, my experience with these plumes is when you, the first time you pick it up, um, the, the numbers are going to go up, not down after that. 244-1777, toll-free 877-291-8255. Uh, we go to Burlington, uh, take another call. Thank you, Scott, for calling. How are you? Hi, good. How are you? Good, good. Go ahead. So uh, on, a, on a, another talk show on TED yesterday, they were talking about small-scale nuclear power similar to a nuclear submarine. And, I, and they were suggesting that could be used in Burlington. And I'm wondering if that is any safer than, than the uh, other kinds of nuclear power you've been talking about. Okay. All right. Thanks for your call. Arnie? Yeah, you know, there are these things called uh, small modular reactors, which are similar to a reactor on a Navy sub. Um, the comparison to a Navy sub, though, is wrong because the Navy doesn't have cost pressures. Um, and, uh, you know, they build them for what it costs, and you know, crew safety and operational safety are, are critical. So these small modular reactors are, have never been built uh, commercially, and they're actually too small individually to make economic sense. So what they'll do is they'll probably uh, put 10 small reactors running one large turbine so that it makes economic sense. And I've looked at the, the, they're called SMRs. I've looked at these SMRs, and I can't figure out how you make any money at it, nor can Wall Street. You know, this is all being funded by the government. The, um, uh, the issues related to it are the, are the same. You know, we've got the same amount of radioactivity in 10 reactors that we have in Vermont Yankee and things like that. Um, and um, operationally, it's really hard to get 10 horses pulling uh, the, the, the same. So there's a lot of science and engineering that has to be done before these things become uh, licensable, and then it's another 10 years before they ever get built. The industry says they need 70 orders in order to build a facility that makes economic sense, and right now we have none. Um, that money's much better spent. There's a guy named Amory Lovins at Rocky Mountain yeah. Institute who yeah. uh, clearly shows that um, spending money on new nukes is uh, much less cost-effective than uh, than spending money on um, renewables and uh, um, a grid that can handle renewables. So I think while technically it's possible, it makes no economic sense. And, uh, you know, 10 years from, 100 years from now, this argument is not going to be about being pro-nuke or anti-nuke. The argument is going to be about do we want distributed power with solar collectors and windmills and, and other forms, or do we want these large power plants like we built in the 20th century? And I think time's changing, and the 21st century paradigm is going to be to have a distributed network of renewable energy. But, you know, there are people that think, there are smart people that think the bridge to get to that technology is, is through some kind of a nuclear power, whether it's traditional or this new kind. Yeah, I could, I could fill an auditorium with smart people who feel the other way, too. But, yes, uh, the, the pro-nuke people feel like the bridge should be nuclear. But nuclear doesn't play well with a small distributed grid. It's like um, when you have a large power plant on the grid, you need another large plant running but not producing electricity in case the one breaks. Whereas in a renewable grid where there's many, many small generators, you don't have that problem. So when you build nuclear and claim that you are the bridge to the future, in fact, you're um, making the grid less stable because uh, you've got these large you know, elephants out there amongst the, uh, amongst the flowers in the garden. Let's go to Northfield. Mike, good morning. Good morning. I was wondering if uh, you... You and Ernie would talk about uh, the decommissioning fund being, uh, years ago when Governor Douglas was here as our governor. Uh, the Congress uh, made a, a, a bill that would make Entergy fully fund the decommissioning fund, and he vetoed it. 
and I was wondering if uh, Arnie knew anything more about that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, one of the yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Uh, one of the things that uh, Ferens will be releasing in March with the Lintel Act study is uh, as an interactive spreadsheet where anybody can put in the decommissioning fund numbers and the cost numbers and find out how long it takes to dismantle a plant. Right now, there's about $650 million in the fund. And um, uh, to decommission Vermont Yankee, if we weren't worried about the spent fuel, to decommission Vermont Yankee is about 850 So the fund will hit 850 within 10 to 12 years. So we will be able to completely decommission Vermont Yankee by 2029 um, if Entergy doesn't use the fund to, f to fund the spent fuel storage. Decommissioning was, the decommissioning fund and the decommissioning law were never used, were never meant to be used to fund the spent fuel storage, these canisters that will sit on the, uh, on the land for perhaps 100 years until the government takes them. What, there's another $400 million to keep those canisters on the ground and monitor them uh, for you know, as long as 100 years until the government takes them. Entergy's position is that they can take that money from the fund. And uh, the position Fairwinds has taken and, uh, and, and many others are that, that those are two separate things. What you do with the money that goes to spend fuel storage is you sue the Department of Energy. Everybody does it. And eventually they get that money back because they always win these lawsuits. This is because Yucca Mountain is not available to, uh, to store the fuel as the government committed to. So that $400 million, um, actually should come out of Entergy, and then they sue Department of Energy. They win. They get it back. But Entergy's position has been, until just yesterday, that they were going to take that money out of the fund interest-free, and um, when they got it back, they'd replenish the fund. So they were going to use it as an interest-free loan. Yesterday, they changed their tune, and they said they're not going to take money out of the fund to fund spent fuel storage. If that's true, we can have Vermont Yankee, uh, the carcass of Vermont Yankee, down to uh, you know, back, back to the farmer's field it was by 2029. And the, the interactive spreadsheet that we've developed will show that. Of all the things we've talked about here this morning, of all the things you've written about in your report, how would you answer the following question? Your biggest worry about Vermont Yankee looking forward is what? The next five years. Uh, when the fuel is in that pool, until the pool is done, the fuel is on the ground, um, it's not safe. Uh, so, And when it's moved, let's get the kids out of that school for the summer so that the, the, whatever the chance is, the consequences are so severe, it pays to get the kids out of that school. You mentioned that this report that you did is uh, on a website, that the one you did previously. Where was that? Joint fiscal, did you say? Where was that? Yeah, the JFO website has, uh, we, were, we produced, uh, Maggie and I produced about five different reports for the for the JFO on overseeing uh, for my Yankee. Remember when the, the oversight committee looked at uh, should energy be allowed to operate for another 20 years we determined yes it should and that uh, but there were 80 areas that had to be improved and so the joint fiscal office um, hired fairwinds to make sure that those 80 areas were addressed so we wrote those reports for the jfo and they're on the jfo website thank you very much for your time this morning I appreciate it very much all right. Thank you, Mark. Arnie Gunderson is with Fairwind Associates. He and his wife Maggie run it out of uh, Burlington, and they have been working on issues related to Vermont Yankee, as well as they've uh, done some traveling and worked uh, done some work over in Japan with that disaster at uh, Fukushima. I want to remind you about our good friends at Green Mountain Access. If you need outstanding Internet service, make it our friends at gmavt.net. You can call them toll-free today at one 321 815 You can get a lot more information about them on their website. That would be at gmavt.net. If you ever want to send me emails, you can do so at my Green Mountain Access account. You can uh, send them to mark, M-A-R-K, at gmavt.net. Again, give them a call today for at one 321 815 If you're looking to switch your internet service to somebody local, somebody you can count on, somebody that is right here in your backyard, keeping that money local. 
That's gmavt.net, 1-888-321-0815. That's going to wrap it up for hour number one. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. We'll take your calls the rest of the way down at the legislature coming up tomorrow. This is FM 96.1 WDEV Warren, broadcasting from the top of Sugarbush and AM 550 WDEV, Waterbury, Montpelier. AP Radio.